Hi everyone, welcome to February 18th, 2023's new generative writing workshop. Um, today we're talking a little bit about, oh, I think we're going into dialogue. Yes, because I have a I have a link here about seven simple tips for writing great dialogue. And that's something that I don't think <clears throat> links in the chat, but I'm gonna try right now. And so I'll be sure to make it a bit, no, it does. Um, I can make sure to make it available to you in other ways. And then I'm going to copy the hyperlink and there we go. Okay, so um, this week, you have to write an entire draft of your story. Don't be fooled. Just because it's milestone two, the story should be complete. And if your narrative arc isn't complete, then your grade will suffer in the narrative arc area for sure. So please be sure you write an entire draft of your short story. This short story is something that you will be now doing for the rest of class. So as they say in Indiana Jones, choose wisely. Um, you won't have the opportunity to change. You can change the content of the story, but you can't change which story you're writing on as of what you turn in for module four. And so in it, um, there is a focus on dialogue. So please read my announcement on it. The biggest advice I can give you about dialogue is to please make sure that you don't have people giving speeches. Dialogue needs, it, it, it can become like monologue almost. And so you wanna be able to break up what the person is saying and maybe use an action beat that grounds us back into the setting. Like, you know, she pushed the door open or she looked out the window or something. Um, or have something like a sensory detail. Like she rolled the some things between her fingers and never did this well live. Um, so be sure that you are breaking up your dialogue and then only use simple dialogue tags. And I know this will make most of you crazy, but you need to use he said, she said, asked. And then beyond that, if you want something to express more than that, instead of tagging it with a said or asked, and as Sarah says, no adverbs for sure, um, unless they really, 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 like if there's nothing else you can do, then that adverb will feel natural, but it's very rare. And then if you really wanna emphasize something, have a character slam their fist on the table or have somebody you know, sink into a warm hot tub. I don't know, but whatever it is you're trying to express, let the setting or the sensory detail or the action do that work instead of some cheesy verb that says, she exclaimed. She's not going to exclaim. Just don't. So don't they're not allowed to smirk either. No smirking. It's just a lot of smirking. I'm going to go redo all my smirking. But you can have, you can describe a smirk. Don't yeah. have smirk be the verb. But you could have somebody watching the person talking and say the corner of his mouth mouth lifted up into the closest thing he has to a smirk. And then there yep. you have it. Okay, so that's it on dialogue. I really want to emphasize um, looking at the rubric. Actually open the rubric and read what I'm supposed to grade you on because guess what? It's what I grade you on. So <laughs> I'll be looking for those exact things in your writing and particularly the ones that I think are the magic where the rubber meets the road in writing are things like um, the rhetorical devices, particularly figurative language. That's the one I'm looking for you to really engage on. Mm -hmm. And then sensory detail, that sight, sound, taste, touch, smell. And as I've said a million times, more than you think, because I usually have like 40 something students a term. We do sight and sound very naturally as storytellers, and we need to remember to get into taste, touch, and smell, because those are the ones that will really draw your readers into the scene and stop them from being readers about a story and be almost participants in your story. Any questions? You get extra points if your smell is a taste. Oh, a synesthesia. Good point. A really fun thing to do, and you'll be surprised how much it makes your work come alive. And this is something you could try to do on the second prompt today. Hard to do it on the first because I'm just throwing words at you. Um, on the second prompt, you could take take a sensation. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Hold up and flipping on the top of your head, Sarah. There we go. Um, mm -hmm. Take a sensation and put it in the other sense. So, you know, have your sight be a smell have your sound be a taste, right? And it's hard to do, but fun. And it really shakes up people's heads and can, can drive home even more what you mean by using that figurative language. 
all possibilities. Good one, Sarah. Thank you for reminding me of that one. Okay, so improv writing. It's hard and it's so much fun. <laughs> what happens? And first, the indomitable Kelly Tanner Backenroth is who taught this to me at the Bennington Writing Seminar. She ran a session um, for a bunch of us where, and she was part of our cohort, but she's such an experienced, amazing writer that she ran the session for us. And um, what happens is I'm going to give you an opening prompt, like a thing to start writing about. So keep in mind what character you want to work on. And what happens a lot, at least in this mix for you in your class anyway, is that people end up maybe finding new stuff. If you write about your story that you have now, what you write today may show up in your story. It may not. Um, but I know a lot of people, it's just so surprising what happens in this compressed writing moment that it usually ends up being part of what you turn in for your story, but it doesn't have to be. So I'm going to kick you off with something simple like, I brought you here because, or he brought them here because, you know, depending on what point of view you're writing in. And then you'll start writing. And in about 20 to 30 seconds, I'm going to pop in and say, uh, <laughs> it, it ended up being graphic, a graphic novel part that was hard to find a word on, but I'll pop in and say decorum. And you would have to fit decorum into your, your uh, writing, however you can. And I will type those words in the chat. So you may want to have your chat visible in case you miss any. And you don't have to put every single word in there, but you need to try. Because what happens is your story is going to start swerving all over the place. And to make it fit, your brain will push a consistent narrative for you. It's crazy. It's fun. And it's my favorite writing prompt. I'd like to do it every time. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it's, but you know. We don't because we focus on it. You guys ready to write? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so I do want you to begin by writing down um, whatever point of view you're using. So if you're in first person, write down, I brought you here because. Um, if you're writing about a guy in the third person or an omniscient narrator, do he brought them here because. Um, or if it's a woman, she brought them here because. But put that down. I'm like I'm missing something and it's my timer. Hold on. Okay. Put that down and then on your marks. So where's my clock? Okay. When your marks get set. First word is relentless. Your next word is unearth. Okay, go with uncool. Treasured.
placement. Mutilated. Discarded. Fluoride. Unbothered. And in your last one minute stretch, Russell, take it home. Thirty seconds left. Okay, everyone, I gave you a little bit of extra time because I know it's hard. <laughs> Try to wrap things up, please. Was it super, super fun or just fun? I just, I just felt there wasn't enough time between words to, to get the things down. Perfect. So I just threw them in to a salad, you know, a word salad. Yep, perfect. That's how you should have done. fun and crazy a bit. Yeah, a little bit crazy, right? You've done this. Before. I have anxiety before the second <laughs> meeting of the term. <laughs> okay, so if this is a routine, now I know next time to avoid the second one. Gotcha. No, this is the best one. Yeah, you'll find. You'll find. It just, you know, the first time you do it, Elisa, is a little bit unsettling. And then when you hear what other people wrote and you think about your own writing, You'll be like, I'm going to show back up for the second. <laughs> it's, okay. it's, it's really fun. It's
it's your brain would never have gone there on its own. Instead, it got thrown these words that it was not at all interested in putting in the story. And unsettling that routine is a great thing to have happen in your writing. And, you know, the thing that you can do is go in and make, you know, two or three different six minute things where you just read random words out to yourself in a recording, set them aside for a week. So you've forgotten the words and then do it to yourself. It's amazing. It's really amazing. I highly recommend it. Okay. I should just put up some recordings of just words and you guys can go in and do them yourselves. Huh. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be trustworthy. I'd just pause it. <gasps> oh, it's such cheating. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you have to kind of, I think one of the very best things that this teaches you is to let go of that inner editor for six minutes. And that's letting your inner editor like to pet it on the head and say, I know, honey, we'll get to revise later mm -hmm. is one of the best skills you can have as a writer to let things go and let the writing go out of your control for a little bit, reassuring that editor that control will come later. You know, you can get back to control. Okay, so I'd love to hear what people got. <laughs> what you guys got? I'll go, but I can't help whatever the heck my video is doing. Yeah, uh, it's a little psychedelic. <laughs> it's cold. Your head's wiggling at the same speed. <laughs> okay, Sarah, go ahead. I brought you here because your daughter has been making poor choices at school. We're, con we're concerned it may be stemming from relentless stress at home. Rachel shifted in her chair, her breathing halted, knowing the principal was right. They had just unearthed a suicide letter and razor blades in Cheyenne's bedroom. We don't know what to do with this uncool road she's headed down. I know you treasure your daughter. Maybe some counseling would help, she said, he said, as though he were addressing a simple replacement for what they'd been doing so far. Rachel's face began to burn, and this is stupid, in mutilated embarrassment. <laughs> We're That's afraid to lead him to get, huh? That is not stupid. Okay. <laughs> We're afraid she's not going to, no. We're afraid she's going to act on her plan. Her dad discarded this as though it were nothing. Do you mind if I get a social worker in here? She could help like, <laughs> like fluoride helps fortify our teeth. I would be unbothered if we could come up with an actual plan. Rachel sat back and groaned. She watched out the window behind the principal at the leaves rustling along the sidewalk. I hope this helps. She wiped the tears from her face. Ooh, you got them all in there. I'm so impressed. Everybody, what was your favorite? Mutilated embarrassment. Totally. <laughs> Absolutely, right? Suzanne, was that your favorite as well? Because I can see your face, you can nod. You're on mute. <laughs> um, I really did like the mutilated embarrassment, but I also really like that fluoride. Like that was such a great use of it because it was a very <laughs> interesting. What were you gonna do with fluoride? That's why I threw it in there. Yeah. When I saw that in here, I was like, I'm going fluoride. <laughs> 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 Randall, did you have a favorite that came out of Sarah's? The mutilated line really called to me, but also I, I was also drawn to the fluoride thing because I was first curious to see how other people had used it because it kind of, it stopped my story and made me go in a like 90 degree direction from where <laughs> I was headed to start with. But I kind of liked that because like you said, it, it pushes you out of the comfort zone that you're in and then suddenly you're having to go in a different direction. And I think you handle it well. That was cool the way you put that in. Yeah. So Sarah, which did you hate the most of what you wrote while you were writing it? What I hated the most? Yeah. Um, which, which, which were you the most like, oh, this is never going to work. So I don't like my unbothered line because it was weird forced dialogue. I would be unbothered if yeah, that was annoying to me, but but when you read it, you stopped short and said, this doesn't work. Mutilated embarrassment, right? Mm -hmm. It was one of the best lines in the piece. So that's my way of trying to emphasize as hard as I can. Let your inner editor just be quiet for a little bit, as you did, Sarah, because you were like, I got to just keep writing. 
And some of these lines, let them rest for a little while and come back and you're gonna go, hold on. You believe embarrassment's pretty dang cool, right? I kind of so think just, it it works it kind of works similar to what synesthesia does where it like takes you out of what you expected it put me in mind also of um i'm sure you've seen the movie the dead poet society mm -hmm. when he when he says the sweaty tooth madman that's kind yeah. of what it put me in mind yeah. of i liked it yeah so i just want to keep encouraging you all that that's what happens when we do this this uh, improv writing is that your editor doesn't have time. Your editor has to be like, but I don't like it. And it still goes on the page. And that's so important. Right. Any more thoughts towards Sarah's piece? Okay, really who wants to go next? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're all being polite. I'm going to go with Suzanne at the top. <laughs> Uh, she brought her here because she held an item that she had never seen. She was relentless in pleading, begging to get Janie here. Calliope had been trying to unearth this ancient artifact for over a millennia. It was uncool of you to keep texting at 3 a.m., Janie spoke, pulling her from her thoughts. I'm sorry, that object is a treasured family heirloom. There is no replacement for it. I've been searching for many years for this. The last human she saw it with had been a mutilated corpse, discarded without any dignity on display for those who had taken from the other. Did you mix up alcohol for your fluoride again? Janie joked, bumping her. How could she be so unbothered? Cliope, get, uh, Cliope get, glanced around the park. Her magic didn't detect anything, but a large rustle resounded, shaking them to the core. Did it? Got them all in there. Thoughts, people? I'm amazed at how concise it is. Like you got a whole scene down and um all the words in and not a lot of extra fluff. And that's pretty cool. I'm really <laughs> I'm impressed on how it fits in with your story. Again, I, I just picked up the beginning of your story last week, but I mean, my piece is just a massive ramble of nothingness, but this like really, like it, it sounds like it could be an, a scene in your book. And the fact that you could take this like random sentence and plop it in there is really, it's cool. Or yeah, and cool, not uncool, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I was also struck with the conciseness of it because whenever I was writing I, I, I was like trying to make my hand survive and scribble until I got to the next word yeah. and fit it in and with hers it just kind of felt like she was almost like she was waiting for you to drop the next word mm -hmm. the way it's written which yeah. was was very interesting the difference in writing styles there yeah definitely and it just goes to show you that anything you're trying to write could be written with almost any words. I mean, it makes sense. Would she keep all these words in a revision? No, but it shows you that you can let go, you know, that the being free and putting whatever comes to mind at that moment is fantastic because, you know, it's a cliche, but it's not a cliche. Like cliches are cliches for a reason, but real writing is in the revision. And so you've got to get the stuff down because you'll come up with an even better word in revision, but you need to just get the writing down on the page and then come back and be like, oh, um, actually, Uncle looked really great in yours. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, the mutilated corpse, maybe, maybe that I, I'm just trying to find something or the alcohol for fluoride thing was slightly forced, but mm -hmm. really it all kind of worked, right? Mm -hmm. Sarah, are you adding something? I saw you turn green. No, I agree with what you're saying. Yeah, great, 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 great. Amazing, Suzanne. <laughs> and Elisa, it's unfair because everybody else in this group has tried this one before, so they knew what they were jumping into. But do you yeah. want to re read what you got anyway? Sure. Great. I just have to be able to read my handwriting. Good luck. With that. Okay, I brought you here because I wanted to show you the truth of life, Roger said to Jane. What, she asked, are you talking about? The truth is that life is relentlessly hard in real life. You've been shaded and protected living in the dome above the planet. 
But when you're outside and once we unearth the truth, you're in for a surprise. It's my job as your protector to teach you. Jane paused, thinking it over. That's uncool, she said. I think our dome is great. It's how we trans, it's, it is the treasure dome, the treasure of my life. Are you saying it's false? Sadly, yes, he replied. <clears throat> we raised you there looking for a replacement, but, but found none. Now is the moment of truth. Our world, our original world, was mutilated in the wars of 3031. We decided to leave the planet, to discard it, and move here, to Lanaville. But when we got here, we discovered the planet was coated in fluoride, and we all got sick. So we created the dome, unbothered by consequences, and started turning the, plant, the planet over. We created the dome. While we did this, we unearthed the rustle of a pile of leaves, and we discovered the fluoride as a covering. The truth of the planet, this is the truth I have brought you here to learn, is, and I ran out of time. So none of us are going to know what the truth is. <laughs> Thoughts, everybody. That was awesome. I I felt like it almost felt like you were doing a stream of consciousness and you were world building for a story with the words that were being thrown, which I, I loved it. That was really, really cool. Yeah. In a very short period of time, you set up that this is unearthly. And that is amazing. Um especially since there isn't necessarily a ton of like world bit building or setting kind of stuff. We still, by the dialogue and um, your use of the words provided, uh, we're able to set us outside of what we might've expected. And I thought that was pretty powerful. Thank you. Yeah, I really love that world building. Like, if you wrote more on this, I would want to know more. So it was like so cool how much you built with like these random words too. Um, no, it was really exciting. Yeah, it's post-apocalyptic with a, a a person raised in a dome who's supposed to save the entire like possibly human race in one, mm -hmm. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thrown words. I mean. That was really impressive. And the funny thing, so two things that I love. One, you repeated the words later. You let them be something of power in your story by bringing them back in. Unheard of, amazing, nobody's done that before. And then the kind of funny thing is that, so when you went back to revise this one, you'd be thinking about, I, I, my guess is that you use the word truth seven times in it. So unquestionably this piece is about some kind of truth that we never get to find out what it is because you <laughs> ran out of time but um it, how fun to be like okay what is this story about like what is the truth and what is the larger theme or idea i'm trying to get out here and so when you find in this fast writing that something like that does show up it's telling you what you're writing about and then you just have to figure out how to revise it and write a bunch of writing right yeah, when I'm done when I'm done with writing my short stories for the class. <laughs> right. Right. It'll it never ends, I promise you. <laughs> that was great. Okay, so Randall, we left you for last, but it's not the least. Do you have something you want to share with us? Yeah, I do. Yeah, great. He brought them here because there was no other choice. The sound of blood and fire filled the sky, a relentless harbinger of what was to come. They were nothing in their own minds, unimportant, yet he knew the champions that stood within. They simply had to be unearthed from the debris of their normal lives. Apocalypse, huh? So uncool. The teen shook his head. He treasured their indomitable spirits, regretted the pain and suffering he would bring to their lives, yet there could be no replacement for the Guardian program. So many champions mutilated, once, and once now, the cycle began again. They saved the world, were discarded, were replaced. He turned his eyes back to them, to better times, to the teenager smells of deodorant and perfume and fluoride. Many of you will die, he warned. With the typical imp immortality of youth, they shrugged, unbothered. The rustle of their clothes filled the silence of the cave. If that's how it is, so be it. One of their numbers stepped forward. Let's save the world. 
Wow. Can you read the unearthed sense sentence again? Because I really like that one. Let's see. Um, they simply had to be unearthed from the debris of their normal lives. That's awesome. Okay, more thoughts. I have was, fun. was this a poem or prose? Uh, prose. It was kind of a stream of consciousness thing. I really did not have anything in mind when I started. So, because it sounds a lot like a poem, like maybe it was also the cadence that you read it. It was great, and I loved the the perfume, deodorant, and fluoride. Yeah, it didn't feel to me like you made some different turn at fluoride. It seemed like it flowed from mm -hmm. beginning to end just fine. Good. I really loved like especially some of the imagery that like the sound of blood and fire like I was like into this like very interesting thoughts especially like I want to know more about the guardian program and like repeating the cycle so like I want to know more about your world and so that was really cool. So I loved hearing also so same with Suzanne and then Sarah said beginning to end right I think that you wrote almost a complete flash fiction in this because it has a beginning middle and end to a, a scene but you've given so much about this world that I mean if somebody in the sort of science fiction or maybe fantasy but probably science fiction world was taking flash fiction I mean you have this guy he's got blood and fire harbinger is one of those huge words of saying we've got you know like world ending stuff going on and then the apocalypse and he's got these new recruits who are supposed to become the new guardians but we know this hasn't been working because the program has there's no other way but you know they keep dying <laughs> and then this sort of melancholy for this trainer this person who creates the the guardians by turning to the smell of the fluoride and the the deodorant of teenage years right and then you can see them they're like they're unbothered you know just the rustle of their clothes because they're ready to get moving like that sense of action about to happen i mean i think i don't know how many words you got but I don't know, clean it up and send it out to science fiction that takes flash. It was, I thought it was complete, which is hard to do in six months. Those are my thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? Was I wrong? Tell me I'm wrong because it's okay. Argue with me. I'm not the final <laughs> voice in here. We all liked it, so we can't argue. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep in mind, I'm a fellow writer, fellow, fellow creative writer who wants you to get that published. <laughs> okay, well, that was just inspirational. I feel like we should quit, but we won't. Um, the next prompt is I want you to take your favorite sentence. So take a moment before we start writing and pick your favorite sentence out of what you just wrote. And then I want you to start new writing with. So you started to create a world, each of you did. And now I want you to take that um, some of you had complete worlds, like Elisa, you also had a pretty complete world. Um, Randall, you had a complete world. What might happen in those cases is if you were to write a novel, you just cut off into a different scene, right? Um, actually, you all had pretty complete worlds. So, you know, maybe find a new scene. Definitely take it in a new direction. I will not be throwing words at you this time. It is to show you what happens when you have shut down that, that inner editor. What could you do with what you got on the improv writing to write something allowing your inner editor to be a part of it. I'm, I'm confused. You want us to take a sentence and re redo it or, the, or just a whole scene? Take a sentence and build a new scene beginning with that sentence. So the first thing you need to do, and before I start the timer, I want you to pick a sentence and write it down. And then um, either like Randall and Sarah, cause you can't look at me. Um, just tell me when you're ready, your sentence is written down, and then Elisa and Suzanne just kind of nod at me or whatever. Cause I just I'm ready. Good to go. Oh, sorry. One second. One second. I'm ready. Those of you I can't see, no cheating, no writing. Wait for the six minutes. <sighs> okay. On your marks, get set, write.
Sorry, phone's beeping. All right, everybody, come on back. Lisa, I muted you because of your creative sounds. <laughs> my my cousin had to send me emotion emergency stories from the Babylon Bay. <laughs> Sorry. 
while y'all are coming back, um, I was reading this book by Catriona Sylvie called Meet Me in Another Life, which is this amazing, it's science fiction-ish, definitely quantum mechanics, which is that other prompt that we'll probably do next time where you walk through a door and have another life. And um, so I'll try to I'll try to shake it up to make it different for those of you who have done it, but definitely like parallel lives, repeated lives, that kind of thing. And it was so good that 60% through when I was reading it audio, you know, so I'm shoveling horse manure and listening to this book. I was like, I wonder if she has a contact form. So I went and found her and was like, I'm 60% of the way through and I'm going to tell you how much I love this book. And she wrote me back. Ah, oh, that's nice. And then she said, but I, I want to know, like some people don't like the ending. <laughs> So then I wrote her back and I said, no, 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 I love the ending. It was amazing. And it was one of the possible endings I had in mind, but better because of course you're the author and you always make it better. So um, how fun that I had a little email exchange with this author of a book that I admire so much. And if you uh, are so inclined, uh, meet me in another life at Triona, which I thought was pronounced Katrina, but when you have audiobooks and they pronounce the name, you have to think they got it right. So Catriona Sylvie. <laughs> and of course, I love books with lovely British accents because they're just a pleasure to listen to. I, I just started Three Body, the Three Body series. It was recommended by someone in the previous class. Ah, type it in the, type it in the chat. Three body. It. Apparently it's based on some science about there is a gravitational something or other called a three body problem. Sounds good. That's I didn't way that. beyond. My son explained it in small words to me last night because he's a scientist and I still didn't understand it. <laughs> but if you get over that. It's still a good book. It's still a good book. It starts off with the Chinese revolution, but they end up going to space. So we have to awesome. get- Awesome, don't tell us anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I hate having things um, told to me too much, so. Yeah. And I didn't know that Meet Me in Another Life could be science fiction until I looked her up. So I read 60% of the book not realizing it's science fiction, which is as much really? as I want to tell you at this point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, how did it go as far as, because so many of you got these complete stories, how did it feel to break out a sentence and head into a scene? What was that experience like? Thanks, Elisa. Felt oh, natural to me. Good. Of course, it, yep. you've been here a few times. <laughs> yeah, I, I carried on with the same theme. I thought very briefly about changing it from sci fi to something else, but that just warped my mind too much. But I just, it, it completely changed where I was by, by forcing myself to think in another direction. It totally changed that truth that we're never going to find out. Okay. Interesting. Anybody else have an experience you want to share? Mm -hmm. All right, then who wants to read what you got? I don't mind. I'll go first. I'll be the guinea pig. Okay. Unbothered by circumstances, we started turning the world over. That was my sentence. Unbothered by circumstances, we started turning the world over, Roger explained. When we did, we found it full of xelophonia, the most needed mineral on the, in the universe. And so like many idiots before us, we mined and mined and mined and overmined, and then ruined this glorious planet of Lanaville before it had time to create a third generation of our people. Thus, Roger said, picking up his cane and wiggling it in the blue sand, we picked up and moved to Aqualand. We found this new planet Full of water. Here we learnt our lesson, and that is why we live so lightly off the land. We grow our wheat and barley, we raise our chickens, we fish under farmed, approved, supervised circumstances, and take nothing from the core of the planet. Jane looked up. That was wise, but we are suffering for your faults. We might live fine, but we are poor and defenseless against the other planets. We need to find a middle road, not mine to death or live sparsely. Meet somewhere halfway. And another complete story. What's everybody's thoughts? 
I really liked like you expanded on the world and made it even like even more fleshed out in such a short amount of time um that's still leaving me like oh what is going to be that middle ground of like how is it going to continue so it was really good thank you blue sand kind of took my imagination away with it I liked that detail um I also liked suffering for your thoughts as a phrase um you seem to do this extremely naturally which is a gift and um I hope that you do turn it into something more oh it seems like just silly rambling to me like but it's fun any thoughts, Randall? I think the I liked the introduction of the conflict idea of like the limited resources and that they had overmined and made the mess that they had. To me, that that's an interesting conflict that you could expand the story on as well. It could be that you know not everybody agrees with his opinion that they've done too much. There may be people that think they need to do more, and that would be a good source of potential conflict for you. Yep. Yeah, it's really neat. And I think that um, there's room for the larger version of the story to um, show the way that they're defenseless against other planets. Have they been attacked? Have, you know, or is there just like a hint of danger and they need to prepare or, you know, definitely meeting that tension that Randall described is the most important thing when you have it in the story. You know, every good story has to have friction in it to make it work. You know, I'm... At the 50% point in Barbara King Solver's Demon Copperhead right now, and I'm so irritated because things are going well, and I know, <laughs> you know, friction has to show up again. So, yeah, very, very good potential for friction and definitely an understanding of how these dichotomies could exist. Nice. My grandmother is calling me. And I, <laughs> I owe her a phone call and she's 96 years old. So let's go to the next person and I will call her back. I'll go. Um, her dad had discarded as her dad had discarded this as though it were nothing, but Cheyenne didn't care. She and her two best friends walked into a quick trip. Hold on. Uh, walked into a quick trip. Shelly headed to the alcohol section, Cheyenne to the medicine section. Ro Rosie walked up to the cashier to distract him. Looking around, Cheyenne grabbed as many Benadryl packs as she could fit and shoved them into her bag, scraping her hand on the zipper as she walked away. Shelly was already outside when Cheyenne and Rosie came out, her bag laden with a bottle of vodka. Are you sure you want to do this? Rosie asked. I can't do the, anything anymore, Cheyenne said as they hurried their steps back to school. The winter wind burned her cheeks, or maybe it was excitement. She was going to do it today. Arriving back at the school, they, the girls split off. Cheyenne headed to the bathroom. Ten minutes later, she stumbled into English class. Are you okay, teacher asked. Cheyenne stumbled to her chair. The teacher walked over to the internal phone. Principal Gallagher, can you come to room 211? We have a problem here. What's the matter with you? Cheyenne heard some unnameable face ask her as her head bobbed, the booze and pills slowly descending over her consciousness. So her, her classmates are gonna help her commit suicide. Is that what I'm understanding? That's yes. It seems weird, but it happens apparently. That's heartbreaking. Yeah. But the writing is fantastic. But that's, did, I didn't know that was a thing. That's wow. Yeah, I mean, to be a good friend is to help somebody lose their life is, you know, just really startling. Mm -hmm. Wow. But it was fabulous. Oops. Yeah, I definitely thought it was going to when you said booze and I'm like, oh, okay, she's going to go like do some unhealthy coping. And then once he said the pills, I was like, oh, oh no. So it was like really heartbreaking, but I also like how you put the words in the sentence to make it, you go, oh, oh, type of thing to like to lead you along the story. Yeah, so I mean, syntax, right? Because of the ordering of the words. 
um, and look at how automatic it can be because you did it in six minutes, but also uh, a little bit of rhetorical devices by kind of some foreshadowing to let us know what's coming by the time she's stumbling out of the bathroom into the room. Randall, I'm sorry, I jumped in. Do you have oh, no, time? you're fine. I, I also think that um, the approach that you took as far as the uh, point of view helped helped to build the tension in the story because if we had been privy to more of her thoughts it might not have been so startling because you know my first thought when you said that about her stealing Benadryl I was like you know is she like selling drugs or is she making drugs I thought was thinking like troublemaker and then the vodka kind of reinforced that and then when it, when you got to the part where she, I think you said um she was going to do it today or something to that effect. That was when I realized, Oh no, this is something completely different. And it, to me helped reinforce, like I felt like an outsider watching this person go through this action rather than knowing what she was doing. And it, to me, that added to the impact of your story because it hits so much more viscerally whenever it's just like all of a sudden, Hey, this girl's trying to take her life. Yeah, and you want us to be an outsider, unlike the cases where we want the reader in the story. In this case, you want us to feel helpless because we would want to change it and we can't. We're not part of it. All, the, all that we can do is witness it and be um, upset. I mean, upset because this happens, upset because this is a real thing, you know, and, and changed as readers. You know, this is a case where in this brief instance, uh, Cheyenne didn't change. But we as readers are because, like Elisa said, we didn't even know this was a thing. Now it is in our worlds. Whether it is or isn't, it is. Because <laughs> you wrote it, right? I actually have great, I, I don't know if respect is the right word, but great respect for the friend because it, it's, it shows how much they, they understand. I mean, they should have reached out from someone and stopped it from happening, blah, 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 blah. But a therapist once told me the hardest part of therapy is when you're starting to feel better because he said, when you're really down at the bottom of the bog, you don't actually have the energy to commit suicide. He's like, it's just, you're too immobile. It's only when you start turning the corner towards up that you realize how ruined your life is and how much you don't want to be there. And so obviously the correct response from these girls from, from that idea would have been to go get help but the level of friendship that's required to understand that someone just just is done and to help them is phenomenal. And that came across so well. It was really impressive. Or they're too immature to realize the consequences of what they're or, doing. Yes, there's that. <laughs> I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, but I also like, I don't, I don't respect that in the friends, but I do respect that they may be like, as friends, we should help her do what she wants to do without really thinking through that yeah, this I mean, really could kill her. Yeah, no, I agree. I think there's a difference between doing it as an adult and doing it. How old are these girls in your story? Right. That's the one thing we could give some insight to. Yeah. 15, you said? Mwah. I don't know. 15 is such a weird age. That's an age where any of the above could be possible. Yeah. It's like There's adults awesome. are the enemy. What? So adults are the enemy. So why would we go to them for help? Right, right. Yeah. So thank you for once again, we can count on you to break our hearts. Well done, Sarah. <laughs> it is, it is heartbreaking, but at least I'm a little bit steeled to it. I'm expecting it a little more. <laughs> You're what? I'm expecting it a little more from you now. Like I, when you <laughs> read, I, anything could happen. <laughs> I can't write poofy. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That is fair. Okay, so Randall or Suzanne, would either of you like to share what you got? I'll go. Okay. They saved the world, were discarded, were replaced. The catacombs that housed them filled slowly, but the millennia were long, and time holds no meaning for the dead. Their bones were marked with the broken lines of explosions. A poem told a single time in one fiery moment of tragic finality. Their forms were burned by the jealous caress of laser blasts, marked for all time with a story that could never be retold. The darkness contained them all, carved stone absorbing the immeasurable energy of a thousand heroic ends. It was like new, a nuclear explosion smothered out by a simple pillow. The hallways filled, the sconces dimmed, 
and all the suns of all the worlds went dark. Only then did Heimdall's horn cry out, echoing through the sun, through the sun's eons silent tunnels. A billion billion collective crackling breaths, and the dead heroes walked once more. Wow. Wow. That's so lyrical. Is there would you all be tolerant to me asking him to read it one more time? Because it was so dense in a good way. I want to yeah. hear it one more time. Okay. If everybody's okay with it. Yeah. Yep. They saved the world, were discarded, were replaced. The catacomb that housed them filled slowly, but the millennia were long, and time holds no meaning for the dead. Their bones were marked with the broken lines of explosions. A poem told a single time in one fiery moment of tragic finality. Their forms were burned by the jealous caress of laser blasts, marked for all time with a story that could never be retold. The darkness contained them all, carved stone absorbing the immeasurable energy of a thousand heroic ends. It was like a nuclear explosion smothered out by a simple pillow. The hallways filled, the sconces dimmed, and all the, gun all the suns of all the worlds went dark. Only then did Heimdall's horn cry out, echoing through the eon's silent tunnels. A billion billion collective crackling breaths, and those dead heroes walked once more. Wow, I don't know how you do that in six minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, except for that, I do suspect you're writing on something that has been in your head. Like, you know what I mean? It's you're letting loose something that has been germinating, but I don't know about that. So thoughts not, from people? Oh, Randall first. Sorry. I was just gonna say not particularly. Um, when I took that line, I I didn't really know where I was gonna go with it, but I did approach it from end up approaching it from like the viking concept of ragnarok like yeah. and i imagine like what happens if ragnarok doesn't happen in fantasy but if it exists in the sci-fi times and that's okay. when it happens so that was kind of it it wasn't something i'd planned it kind of just came up but it fits in a, a narrative we know which is ragnarok which is such mm -hmm. a great way i mean you how many stories do we read that are the retelling of hamlet or ragnarok i, I can't say that right uh -huh. um, yeah, or or Greek tales or Ulysses, right? So it's a it's a great way to base something, obviously, because wow, thoughts from the rest of you. I love the jealous caress of laser blast. Mm -hmm. That that really uh, and you know the, the poem, the single what was it poem single time? It's so true. Um, and there, there are memorial poems and stuff that that stick with us that have always, you know, it's just one thing that just means everything. And this, I mean, I thought this was, again, I think this is more poem than anything else, but it was fabulous. But especially that caress of the laser blast was fabulous. I'm just going to hop in really quick here with the idea that when Elisa says it sounds like a poem, I think what I'm hearing her say is that your language is really lyrical. And it's okay for prose to have lyrical language. In fact, some of the best prose does. Because, um, you know, we're not hearing things like line breaks or enjambment or anything like that, but we are hearing this deeply figurative language that is beautiful. And that does seem poetic in experience, but it does feel prose like to me in the reading is that is am i am i interpreting yeah. Lisa? okay great <laughs> i think it's also randall's voice he's got one of those like you got know nice he's a tv narrator or something you know james old jones <laughs> you know, like that yeah 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 well i would love to play darth vader if anybody <laughs> knows the right people let me know. <laughs> oh darth vader with a bit of an accent that'd be perfect <laughs> <laughs> okay suzanne or sarah I kind of like want to take every sentence and just sit with it on the, its own value, like marred with a story that could never be retold. All of the sons of all of the worlds went dark, crackling breaths. I mean, it's, um, it's crazy. Like each sentence is so packed with imagery and meaning and 
creates this, it's like catacombs implied it's closed in, but kind of this vast lostness or something. Like, it's awesome. <laughs> and I'll hop in really quick to say, and that's what's so fun about it is you could just sit and unpack each sentence. Now, could he write an entire novel like this? Randall probably could. <laughs> but, okay, <laughs> not the could. Should he write an entire novel like this? Could we do it as readers? Could we read 250 pages of stuff this dense? I, th I think we would have to pause. So and I've then, read... I've read the Starless Sea like five, six times now. And every time I read it, I like, and I ended up buying a paper copy because I couldn't flip backwards and forwards well on the Kindle. But every time I read it, it was like, oh wait, I think I need to think about this for a minute. And I'd put the book down and do something and come back. And I think if there was a, uh, the whole book was this dense, it would be the same thing. You read like a few pages and then you'd have to like, let it sit and come back. And I think as a reader, it, it, it would be too, you know, if the whole book was like that, it would be right. too much. And like Erin Morgenstern in the Starless Sea, she doesn't, she's not that dense in her language the whole time, but she's that dense in her ideas, which is why you right. have to go back and forth. And so what I wanted to suggest is that maybe Randall is giving us the opening of a myth, you know, the beginning of something like, in the before times, this happened. Right. But when he got all the way into the narrative that that what happened after um, Heimdall's horn was blown would have to be told in a little bit more straightforward narrative. But this is the richness of legend. This is this is what what's carved in runes, or you know, this is telling how something really massive happened, right? So it has that language and rhythm and beat of you know, here is eternity, and this is the way we talk about eternity, maybe. What, what do you guys think of that idea? It kind of reminds me when you say that, like of a poem or a story where someone makes the entire thing one sentence. Oh, and I kind of get tired of trying to grasp the structure for one, but like to keep track of all of the richness would make me tired. Right. So you would you you get to slam us with that for like a big fat paragraph, single sentence or a couple sentences. And then take us into the narrative, right? This, it's, this could it's be a incredible. Problem. We want to keep unpacking it. It's not we want this. We just wouldn't want maybe three hundred pages. Awesome. I think this could be like one of those prologues, like like Sarah said, a poem, but don't do it as a like a prologue, and then like everybody's dead now. Now the horn's been the horn's been blown, and let's hear the story. Suzanne, do you have anything to add? No, it's definitely echoing it. It's like one of those, like, I've been watching a lot of Disney movies lately, so for me, but like the narrator is like giving you like the backstory of like the legend for like the foreshadowing and then the story is told. And I think that would be like a really cool idea, Randall, for you if you did want to expand on that, have that be like the legend of or like the beginning of, and it would have been really, really, really cool. Well, well I know if you want to be Darth Vader. <laughs> and you think this is like that beginning, you know, the beginning of the film so it has like a, the, the, the blurb at the beginning going into the sun to the planets. Yeah. And what I would say is that something about the richness of language, particularly in legend, belongs to the fact that it used to be handed down orally, right? And so you couldn't tell the 250, 300 page novel because somebody couldn't memorize that, but they could memorize this and the richness and the density of it. And so it has that feel. Has that feel of a handed down legend that somebody might be able to repeat before the time of paper? That makes sense, and I I think that kind of flows along with how I intend it to be in a story, though, right? Because I do a lot of like interludes and asides to break things between chapters in my books, and generally I kind of find myself shifting to this style of language in those shorter pieces because I want to like slow somebody down and really draw them into like one moment that was really important rather than the, the progression of the story. So I, the, my inspiration for it, I don't know if any of you have read Patrick Rothfuss, but oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 I want to write like he does. Like I love the way he does his interludes and that's kind of the draw that's driven, that's caused me to practice this way that makes me want to write this way for my interludes. I think, 
Patrick Rothfuss could take the lesson from what you just wrote. I'm just saying. Well, I I don't know if I can agree with that, but I appreciate the <laughs> the, the confidence from you. If you if you could just finish, since he's not a very good finisher at this point. Yeah, that would be definitely. Is <laughs> <laughs> he somebody I want to beat? I mean, a decade ago, I was reading that, and he still has. Yep. I hate him. I love him, and I hate him. I laid him. I'm exactly <laughs> the same. <laughs> Awesome. Oh, Randall, that was great. Okay, so let's, um, it looks like we need Suzanne to bring us home for today, so I can call Grandma back, apparently. <laughs> well, after going after Randall. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, we all have different things happen, and you had brilliant things happen as well. You were the densest person last time, not not mentally, but with your writing. <laughs> Uh, the last human she saw it with had been a mutilated corpse. It had been three millennia ago when Calliope had finally checked the delicate cursed object. The corpse still had the trace of its power threaded between its fingers, charred into a claw. Calliope had been too late in tracking down an object impossible to stay with its host. The other was faster, better, tracking the scent. The two immortals would never get to rest, cursed to repeat the cycle of cat and mouse trying to capture the trinket named World Under. Clypey's mouth burned with anger. She needed to own in on the object before the other created more cursed beings, beings that preyed on her favorite species, humans. Clypey had been too distracted by them, trying to teach and learn from them, too careless. That's all I got. <laughs> Could you tell me again that little part around the trinket? I missed what the trinket meant. Uh, the It's a cursed object that I haven't really thought too much of it, but its name is World Ender. Got it. That's what I missed. Thank you. Knitting like K-N-I-T-T-I-N-G? Uh, trinket? Or... Did you say knitting? Like the word knitting? Or... At the end, the second to last word, I think, or third to last. Uh, the last, uh, trying to teach and learn from them too careless or higher. 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 One more time. It's it. Yeah. Please read it again. Okay, okay. Uh, the last human she saw it with had been a mutilated corpse. It had been three millennia ago when Clybe tracked the delicate cursed object. The corpse still had the trace of its power threaded between its fingers, charred into a claw. Clybe had been too late in tracking down the object impossible to stay with its host. The other was faster, better, tracking the scent. The two immortals would never get to rest, Curse to repeat the cycle of cat and mouse, trying to capture the trinket named World Ender. Clybe's mouth burned with anger. She needed to own in on the object before the other created more cursed beings, beings that preyed upon her favorite species, humans. Clybe had been too distracted by them, trying to teach and learn from them, too careless. Nice. Also, did you notice that in getting a second chance to read it already, it sounded a bit more narrative-like? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to read your own work um, and make it sound like what you want it to sound like on the first try. Uh, but you're, I, I mean, even in the time we've been doing this, you're becoming a better and better reader every time. It's great. It's the practice that you said when I first wouldn't read my stories out loud. <laughs> Last <laughs> term. <laughs> Yeah, and and you know, I mean, there's I've learned so much from listening to audiobooks about the way that a lot of authors have a voice in their head when they're writing. And I didn't really used to have one in that way. I mean, I really grew to understand what a narrative voice sounds like in a way that I wasn't complete in my head because my reading voice in my head couldn't couldn't wasn't as good as audiobook narrators are <laughs> and now my reading voice in my head is better too the, the silent one simply from having spent all this time listening to people read books it's fascinating 
but it's such an important skill because every author who successfully publishes has to read out loud. I'm a, I'm doing a reading in October. I don't consider myself a successful, successful publisher, but I have published and I'm doing a reading in October at the University of Omaha and you can bet I'm already practicing. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way you said that they could still feel the the threads of the power in the in the fingers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something like I would elaborate, whether it's shiny or not shiny or how she senses the power. But the fact that it's been three millennia and she can still feel there's something there in the in the fingers. It really I like that. Thank you. I think my favorite uh phrase was um mouth burned with anger mm. that was kind of cool because i don't really think of a mouth burning but i can understand what you're going for so that's pretty cool yeah kind of cross anesthesia mm -hmm. Extra credit. I, I have to ask Suzanne, are those cats wandering behind you in the blurred out screen or dog yeah. or something? Um, you probably saw my cat. Okay. <laughs> <Blurred> <laughs> out. Out. I get some water. <laughs> <laughs> like trying to figure out if it was a cat or a dog. <laughs> yeah, he has his own notebook he has to sit on if I try to write or do any school work or work. <laughs> <laughs> Randall, did you have anything to add about um Suzanne's piece? I think you've got a great conflict set up there. Um, I like the scale that you have with the, um, it seems almost like God goddess type thing that's competing over humans and this other species or whatever that you've uh, started right on. And uh, when are you going to have the manuscript done? <laughs> that's my Perfect. solid story. I love, I love stuff like that. So. I do too. And I really loved, along with Randall, <clears throat> there's this idea that this 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 polar opposite to her, they're cursed to repeat a cycle. So they keep competing over this trinket. And it took its time tracking the scent and creating more of these crisp beans. Ooh, crisp beans, right? I mean, air fried. Anyway, um, and her favorites are humans and she slowed down to enjoy them and put her behind in this competition. So you got a lot of fun in this in this piece. Like you got a lot done in six minutes towards showing us an entire world where this is again kind of like Randall's legend where you know there is something on the epic scale happening here. And so we want you to finish the book. Yeah, thank Tomorrow? you. Is that too soon? <laughs> After the kaleidoscope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean and, I don't... and Sarah's grades suffer due to the kaleidoscope, thanks to Dr. Max. <laughs> yeah well you know <laughs> they're not all my prompts some of them are some of them are cats so, yeah. I have a question about all this so these little blurbs that I wrote right I mean I just wrote them and just pick them up throw away the paper should I just do any of you do like just transcribe these little notes? Do you keep them? Do you stick them in a drawer? I mean, I have to transfer them to the computer because five minutes from now, I won't be able to remember what I wrote. But like, what do you do? Because I've got millions and millions of like little ideas on my computer that are never going to go anywhere. And then I have these two books I wrote previously that I now see how much work needs to be done to edit them. And I don't know if it's worth doing. And I have like all this other stuff in my head that I don't that know. That means you're a writer. Yeah. But I, I just don't know what to do with it. Like, do I just keep these files? Do I keep these notes? Do I just throw it out and think, oh my God, this was just six minutes exercise? Like, what do you guys do? I, I usually, well, I used to type it as I was writing, but, um we're suggested to write it instead of type it, but I usually go back and put it in my computer because otherwise I'll lose it. And then um, sometimes I'll come back to it and see if I wanna turn it into something bigger. Other times it, some of my stuff fit into a piece that I'm already developing. And so 
then it gets kind of thrown in with that. But I mean, you could turn any of these into little flash fictions and like there is a whole publishing market for flash fiction. So getting on um, something like Duotrope website and looking at publishers and what they're looking for. There's a lot of things you can do. But is it worth the time and the effort that you put into doing that? That's up to you. Yeah. Right? Because, I mean, I can't answer that for you. But like, what, see, this is where I'm, this is where I'm really torn with what I should be doing. Because, you know, like I said, my previous stuff, I sent out 150 letters or whatever it was. I wrote it in the 90s. And I, you know, got a bunch of replies of this needs, that needs, whatever. And it sort of, you know, life got crazy and it ended up in a drawer. But especially these like blurbs and these short stories, is it, you know, I write them for my own amusement. Is it worth the tens and tens of hours trying to get something published or like, what's the, like, I don't know what my own end goal is. Yeah. Sometimes no, like, for say... me, this is big practice. Like mm -hmm. you start developing your skills of putting in red rhetorical devices and adding in sensory details and stuff like that. So that when you go to write what you actually intend to make something out of, you've got this strength behind you that you have been practicing and working on. Okay. And quickly, I would say it's up to you to develop what your goals are. So like developing that instinct is definitely up to you. And I know that when I was in my Bennington program and working with mentors who I had access to, like real authors who were my people that were helping me, I would ask him questions like this because I wanted them to help tell me where to go and they never mm -hmm. would. And I, I have decided that's the best thing that they can do because you end up pursuing what matters the most to you. Or mm -hmm. the thing that you can't let go. Like my memoir probably doesn't matter the most to me, but it needed to get out of the way. So I finished it. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I finished it. Now it's not finished. But um, you have to do what causes the most friction in your life and has to be written. You have to pursue the goal that matters the most to you. And part of that process is figuring out what matters the most to you. Anybody else have more suggestions for Elisa? And that's the problem is I don't eat... I'm really enjoying this. I really enjoying the class, but I also really enjoy the lit classes and analyzing that. And I don't, I don't, I'm doing all this for fun. I didn't, I'm not doing it because I need to work or da, da, da. I'm just like, I'm retired. I wanted to do something fun, blah, blah, blah. And I really don't know, you know, what so to have like. Fun. I mean, Right, I, like, I we aren't like, here to tell you what to do with it. We're here to say, if you want to take fun and push it farther towards publishing, do it. If you want to just have fun, do it. If I were you, I would organize things in a findable way. I'd mm -hmm. type in what you did today and just call it, you know, like this new generative workshops folder, and then you know where to find it again. If okay. something strikes your fancy, put it in that folder, and then you know to go look back through your folders. Okay, thank you. All right, any questions or ideas before we finish up? We managed to go almost to 10.30, which I'm surprised and delighted by. It was a really good session today. Say hi to grandma for us. <laughs> I will if she can hear me. She's, boy, at 96, mm -hmm. it's gonna be hard for her, but I'm gonna give it a try. No, you're lucky to have her. I hope she's I nice. I am lucky, so she's... lucky. Good. Okay, everybody, take care. Right. I'm gonna try to hold this in two more weeks. Right before AWP is in Seattle. Okay. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye. bye.